Well, we have source code, which is an uh, interesting medium because it communicates to two different audiences. So it's B-model, they say. It's one modality and communicates to human audience, like a human who's going to read it and write it, and there's machine audience, like computer who's going to execute it. And uh, in, in scientific literature, there is this uh, hypothesis called um, naturalness hypothesis that we actually were verifying that says that because of this B-model nature of communication, the corpora of the source code must exhibit statistical properties similar to the corpora of natural language text. So that way, uh, natural language processing kind of tools and models should be applied. Nice. Sorry, nice. We've Sorry. got the slide. No, no, no problem. Yeah, we've got the slides. So it's going to be more interesting. That way. And. Uh, Thanks. Awesome. Looks great. Like this, like that, and like this. Yay! Awesome. Yeah, one more second. So yeah, basically, we're going to skip some, some things. But the idea of the talk is, was exactly like that, motivation. And then we will go through details of one research, the technology stack that it took to conduct research like that, and the next research that we did this year. Um, so we can skip that. But the, the, the motivation for that is actually these data points. You can see that it's, it's kind of you feel it that way, but there's some measurements telling you how the source code um, code bases behave with time and you can see example of subversion and git and you can see though it's not big projects they're both growing in size and there's G gnome and gtk and uh, mozilla firefox and chromium and these are all plots of l number of lines of code every year and you can see it, it growing and it's actually well you might say that it's growing exponentially because it, you can see it's doubling every five seven years and it's just early stage of, of that growth. And operating system kernels, and those are just all open source projects, but in, in closed sourced world, in the companies, code bases are order of magnitude bigger, actually. And that means that we all, in open source world and in closed source world already, are gonna hit this problem on how we're gonna manage that number of source code, the, the, the code base that is two billion lines of codes. How would you even understand what it does, what are the components? With the current tools, it's very, very laborious process. So we need better tools. And better tools in all aspects of it, like testing, writing, reading, navigating it, discovering that inside your code base, you actually have similar libraries doing similar things. It's not trivial. Uh, and even non-code aspects like legal, how to verify that you didn't bring in compatible license into your source code, one of your two billion lines or hiring, uh, as I give an example of, of previous business model of the company, sourcing the candidates based on the number of open source contributions. So we need help with all aspects of that. And that's the motivation of exploring this space of uh, applying machine learning to the source code. And uh, yeah, by looking at code as a data and taking this natural hypothesis, we were able to show that it does actually make sense on the task of one specific task of a project similarity. Uh, or, or code base similarity. And uh, that's the topic model research I was telling you about. And the idea is that, uh, well, every, every in this case, every word is identifier inside the code base. And then the document is the whole repository. And that way, you can build a topic model for every repository, which tells you the distribution of the topics over the uh, of the document. And then the assumption is that if the documents are about similar topics, they must be similar. And then you would recommend uh, similar vectors in that topic uh, space. And we were able to do that and publish the results and it was accepted and then reviewed and it's a nice paper, you can check it out. But it was ad hoc data collected for this. And it was very specific model for one particular task. We couldn't reuse it for other tasks. So we would need to train again for a different one. And it has, annoying property of having one hyperparameter of fixed number of topics. So 
optimizing for that is hard. So we decided to fix data collection first and build um, an open source stack that everyone could use and, and, and play with. So before that, if you do any kind of research like that, your collection, your, your process will look like this. You get some ad hoc script, you get the data specific to the task. It's actually quite small. And uh, well, as you might know, the whole data-driven project, including machine learning, looks more like this. And machine learning is just a small part of it. There are a lot of other things that needs to be taken care of to get a successful outcome. We, we actually maintained the list of, created list of papers on this subject on a GitHub. If you're interested in what other people do in academia, that's something to check out. And we wanted to change this to something like that which has the collection pipeline uh, being a common infrastructure, like, uh, you know, like we have operating system kernels which uh, have shared cost of ownership. Many people use it on their servers. We wanted to do the same with the data collection. And then have shared data set that everyone could use and extract data from big enough so you could build a sp specific data sets out of it and the way to, to query it. And uh, this is the technology stack with the project names. They are all open source projects on a GitHub, on sourced organization. I was talking more about it at a FOSDEM meeting this year. I'm just going to very briefly touch up on this. So the first step is, like, the idea is to decouple every step and have a separate project covering it well. And the first step is just distributed git fetch. In, in parallel on many machine and just store the pack files. So this is the collection part. Then the next step is to have a query library that would, tell, would make the cluster of machine go through that pack files and extract the information for that. That's called engine. And you can see example of the query with this library here. Uh, you asked uh, for all reference, references inside all repositories, their files, detect their language, and then extract something from abstract syntax tree of those files. Something you may be interested in, for example, well, just documentation uh, or just the function names or things like that. And then the last part is a distributed parser infrastructure. We call it Babelfish project. Uh, so it has um, input is the source file in, in a number of languages. Uh, and then the output is the annotated abstract syntax tree with some cross language annotations, like roles of the node that you can analyze. And um, Using that infrastructure, we were able to build a corpora, like two terabytes uh, data set of uh, 200,000 most popular repositories on uh, GitHub. And you can see the distribution of languages inside that data set. And you can play with that. You don't need to download all the terabytes to interact with it. There is command line tool, and that's the URL. You can check that. Uh, and using that, we, we, we actually conduct next uh, research on identifier embeddings, which is that applying word to vec style of model to the identifier embeddings. And that one can be used as a building, blocks, as a building block for many tasks, including repository similarity that we already did uh, with the topic model one. And that's how it looks like uh, very, very roughly. So from the source code, went to the syntax tree, annotated with uh, some, some roles using the Babelfish. And he, here we filter abstract syntax tree by the role, and the role is identifier. So we from the source code, we get only identifiers. Uh, the thing that content, uh, can, can contain um, natural language information, like functions, names, variables, names, uh, and so on, class names. Then we tokenize them, and then it build co-occurrence matrix as a first step of particular embedding algorithm that we used. It's called Swivel. Uh, it's uh, similar to wall 2 vec in, 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 in that it's approximate matrix vectorization algorithm, but it's much more scalable and uh, it uh, looks like this. Uh, from, that's an example of co-occurrence matrix over there, but real co-occurrence matrix on uh, half, tens of millions of repositories looks more like this. Then it gets sharded and then embedding that trade for every shard and then you can do that on multiple GPUs and multiple machines. And that's an example of visualization of embedding space using Tisney, which doesn't tell much, but um, well, you can see that things uh, get grouped together there. So uh, yeah, you can check out the, the, the survival algorithm that we applied for embeddings. Uh, and I assume everyone know what, is, what are the embeddings. And this is like dense vector representation of words in some continuous space where similarity between vectors makes sense. So. Um, we applied this algorithm. There is existing implementation that Google open sourced. We have our own fork that is more performant. And we also have a pre-processing step a distributed one. Uh, so you can run this uh, sharding of the matrix on many machines instead of just one. And uh, 
Mm, well, it's a bit different than, than word to vec but the output is, is very compatible. And uh, it's, it's count-based methods. Um, so first, um, you count the statistics of the corpus, and then you, you run training part. Uh, the, the, good, the, the really great property of it was that it scales linearly with the size of vocabulary because of the structure of the matrix, not with the size of, of just your data. So that way you can um, train on much more bigger data set. And, um, okay, that way we just get identifier embeddings, but how would we get to document similarity from those? And there is this known um, algorithm called world movers distance. It comes from the statistics task of earth movers distance and or Wasserstein metric, metric distance, I think. It's called, the, it's a way to measure distance between the two probability distributions. But the idea is that if you can measure the distance between the words, uh, then you can uh, define the distance between sentences as the minimum amount of distance that a word from one document need to travel to the word of another document. And uh, that's an example of it from the paper. There is open source implementation of, of uh, getting this distance between two documents, but what we would need, we would need to get um, a system where you send a query and get n nearest neighbors. And we did the open source implementation of that, uh, that system that uh, called the yeah, um, word movers distance relax <laughs> and uh, it uses uh, results of uh, operations research that, that did google open source and um, it it's an interactive system where you can send the query like example of the repository and here's the output it's nearest repositories in that space and you can see that the, from these results it, they actually make a lot of sense so if you ask for a torch which is machine learning library implemented in Lua, one of the results you get PyTorch, which is a library, kind of similar library, but implemented in Python. Or uh, Intel's uh, machine learning library that is, in f that, that if you read the readme file, you will know that it's inspired by Torch, so it has similar concepts. Mm, the same for GoGit, which is a Git implementation of Go language, and you can see the machine figure out that it's similar to actually libgit2 bindings for Go. So. Uh, it's a Go bindings for native library doing the same thing. And then it's also similar to Node Git, which is uh, Node.js binding for Git. And it uh, it's, it's really makes sense. And what we get is in a completely unsupervised manner, a computer was able to figure out that those things are similar just by doing some, some processing and, and spending some compute time. And um, that's, that's, that, of course, that's kind of very early stage result and, uh, and kind of baby step. But I'm very excited about this because it's kind of similar to what we did with images before. And with the type of open source data collection pipeline and infrastructure, we would be able to build ImageNet of the source code and move on with this research and build more models that, that exhibit more statistical properties and, and, and at the end resulting in more useful products for open source maintainers to automate their routine tasks like code review, um, like um, a lot of patterns exist in naming, like uh, style guides and, and things like that, like uh, refactoring opportunities that um, human might not even aware about, but machine can figure out because some piece of code is similar to another piece of code. And um, of course, there's more research done by other people on this subject. And we, as I say, we maintain the created list of papers you can check out. Uh, we published the data set and it's part of the mining software repositories task this year. So more people are gonna use it at the mining software repositories conference. There are some blog posts that we did about more details for this code similarity, topic modeling, and uh, id to vec research on our blog post. And um, there are some talks that uh, members of the source team already did on parts of this uh, infrastructure and some uh, models that we trained. You can check out and um, all the work and all the code is open source. And uh, this is all a result of working of team of smart people together for maybe about a year. So uh, by no means it's just me doing that. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to thank you and answer some questions if you have. Do you have any questions? You can always ask me later if, if, if there are no questions now. I will be here all day. 
And if you're excited about topics like this, please check out uh, the, the source code and, and the projects. Everything is public and, well, Source is hiring for remote positions as well now. So if you're interested, let me know. Okay, no questions? Then thank you, and I think we're almost on time for the next speaker. Thank you. Sure.